Okay, well, welcome back to our study here in Second uh, Chronicles. Not First Chronicles, Second Chronicles. I don't want to go in reverse. Second Chronicles chapter 23 is where we're going to be this morning. But before we look at this chapter verse by verse, let's open a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for another day you've given us to be here to open your word, to study these great truths. And we just pray you'd write them on our hearts and we'd live them out. And it'd all be for your glory. It's in Christ's name. Amen. So, 2 Chronicles chapter 23, and we move into the reign of Joash. And we were introduced to Joash last time in chapter 22. And his reign is seen in chapter 23 and 24, so we'll have two chapters on Joash here. But speaking of chapter 22, just to reset the context, the historical context where we're at, there's a lot of things happening in the southern kingdom at this point of time. And recall from 22 that Joash's father was Ahaziah, and he was killed by Jehu, who was going around doing some purging. And he was assassinated, and that allowed Ataliah to basically come to the throne of the southern kingdom as the queen. And one of the things that she did to gain that throne was she executed all of all of Ahaziah's children except for one. And that one child that was not found and executed was Joash. And it was actually through Ahaz's sister. And she is named Jehoshabet. She's also the wife of Jehoiada, who's going to play a prominent role uh, both in chapter 23 and 24. He's a priest. And interestingly enough, Jehoiada is not mentioned anywhere else, not even in the, the priestly genealogies. Now, there is a Jehoiada during the time of Jeremiah the prophet. I think it's around chapter 29 we run into Jehoiada. But that's a very different Jehoiada. That's uh, much later chronologically. So this Jehoiada really is, plays a prominent role here, but nowhere else. And we're going to see that God uses him. He used his wife, and then he's going to use Jehoiada. So Ahaz's a sister, Jehoshabeth, they at. She hides Joash, who is a child at this point, probably a small infant. And this preserves the Davidic line. As Atalia, or Ataliah becomes the queen, she begins to rule. And that is the historical situation. Now, in regards to chapter 23, I break it up into three different sections. We see Joash is enthroned. So we're going to see a shift from Ataliah to Joash, the rightful Davidic king. And it's going to be through Jehoiada's plan. Because remember, Joash at this point is just but a little child. And then the second section, verses 12 through 15, we see Ataliah executed. And then we see a spiritual reform in verses 16 through 21. And it's interesting, I think, we'll, through that spiritual reform, we will also see where the southern kingdom was. It was not a very spiritual place. Now the parallel section, later on, you can go back and look at 2 Kings, specifically 2 Kings 11, verses 1 through 20. It's going to have some different details. Again, the chronicler is writing to post-exilic Israel versus the writer of 2 Kings. So there's a, a difference of, of, of details that are included in both accounts. There's some similarities, but some difference as far as the focus of details. So let's take a look at this, chapter 23, starting in verse 1, which says, Now in the seventh year Jehoiada strengthened himself and took captains of hundreds, Azariah, the son of Jehoram, Ishmael, the son of Yohanan, Azariah, the son of Obed, and Maasiah, the son of Adiah, and Elishphat, the son of Zikri. And they entered into a covenant with him. So we're going to start seeing this plan come together by Jehoiada. And again, Jehoiada is a priest at this point. His wife is the one who took the baby Joash and hid him to save his life. And Jehoiada now becomes a prominent figure. He comes up with this plan. And we see in the first part of verse 1 here that this is occurring in the seventh year. 
in the seventh year. We see that in the Hebrew text here. So Jehoiada strengthens himself. So at this point, Joash is only seven years old. Seven years old. Now why at seven years old Jehoiada puts this plan into place, we don't know. But he seems to feel it's the right time. So in the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and he took captains. So he's going to gather these very uh, influential uh, military men together. And they're going to help him execute this plan. And you see the last part there, is, it says that they entered in a covenant with them. So there seems to be an agreement between Jehoiada and these captains. They're conspiring together to basically overthrow the evil queen and to bring Joash to the throne. Because again, he is the rightful Davidic heir. And this probably would have set home with the readers of Second Chronicles. Because remember, they've come back from Babylonian exile and there's no Davidic king on the throne. Historically at this time, there's no Davidic king on the throne. And we're going to see that God is going to put one back on there. So probably an encouragement to the readers of Second Chronicles here. So the plan takes place. And we see the details starting in verse 2. They went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the heads of the father's households of Israel. And they came to Jerusalem. So the first thing they had to do was to recruit the people who were going to engage in this overthrow. And Jehoiada and these captains, they gather people essentially from two areas. Number one, the Levites, so the religious leaders, but also from the heads of the father's household. So these would just be civilians. So this would be civil leaders. So he engages both of these groups to help him restore Joash to the throne. So verse 3 says, Then all the assembly, so after they've gathered these leaders together, verse 3, Then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God. So we have a covenant between Jehoiada and his captains, but they take this another step. There's a covenant made between the king and and this assembly, then all the assembly made a covenant with the king. And it occurs in the house of God. And that plays a prominent role here, the temple does. A lot of this takes place in the temple grounds, or on the temple grounds, in the temple. So they make this covenant with the king. Now it doesn't tell us what the covenant is. So the thought is, is probably uh, part of it would be the plan to restore him to the throne, but also possibly his responsibilities. And again, he's only seven years old, so uh, the thought is that Jehoiada probably would kind of help him along. That he would, co in a sense, co-rule with Joash. Not in an official sense, but kind of in an advisory role here. So it's likely those details are being worked out and it's put into a covenant form here. But notice the second part of verse 3. And Jehoiada said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has spoken concerning the sons of David. And this is an important part, and I do not believe that this is found in 2 Kings. But notice here, Jehoiada says that he, he wants the king's son to rule on the throne. And the reason is, it's because of the sons of David here. Essentially, he's referring to the Davidic covenant. He realizes that that God has made this covenant with David and his sons and that the appropriate person to sit on the throne of Israel is indeed Joash because he's a son of David. So he brings in the Davidic covenant here. So we see Jehoiada as being a very spiritually minded leader. He seems to be really focused on carrying out the exact plan of God as revealed by God. So he wants to see Joash restored to the throne here. So this isn't just a coup, just to, we don't like the government, so let's overthrow the government. Joash is seeking to restore, jo uh, Jehoiada is seeking to restore Joash to his rightful place. It's his throne. 
It's not Atalaya's throne. So starting in verse 4, we get the exact plan. This is a thing which you shall do. One third of you, of the priests and Levites, who come in on the Sabbath, shall be gatekeepers. In verse 5, and one third shall be at the king's house, and a third at the gate of the foundation. And all the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. So he takes the religious leaders and he separates them into thirds. Now, recall that you're going to have Levites coming in to serve at the temple and leave. Every week this is happening. So you have a set of Levites and priests coming in. They do their ministry work at the temple and then they leave and you have another set come in. And Jehoiada is going to use these people. Now he has to be very careful here. If he makes, if he brings too much attention to himself, Ataliah is going to find out, and this plan is going to be put down. So he's being very cautious here, and he's actually using the normal operations so as not to bring too much attention to the situation. So one third of these priests, the ones who come in on the Sabbath, they're going to be assigned as gatekeepers. One third of them is going to be at the king's house, and then another third is going to be at the gate of the foundation. And then the civil people, the rest of the people, are going to be there at the courts of the house of the Lord. So he has his people strategically situated in all the major places. Now, again, we don't have more details than this, so we don't know exactly why he has them situated in these certain locations. But we know he has a specific plan in place, a plan not to cause too much attention. So he says in verse 6, But let no one enter the house of the Lord except the priests and the ministering Levites. They may enter, for they are holy. And let all the people keep the charge of the Lord. And I find somewhat fascinating here that even though he's putting in this plan to take down the queen and to restore Joash, he's still very concerned about doing it the right way. He's not going to trample on the laws of God and how God has set up Mosaic worship at the temple. He still makes that a priority. And in verse 7, The Levites will surround the king, each man with his weapons in his hand. And whoever enters the house, let him be killed. Thus be with the king when he comes in and when he goes out. Now again, Joash is seven years old. By the way, we also see that in chapter 24, verse 1. Joash was seven years old when he became king. So he, Jehoiada, as part of his plan, makes sure that the king is secure. He has Levites surrounding him with weapons. He's not against people arming themselves. So here we see he surrounds the king with men with weapons to protect him. Because he's planning for the worst. When Joash takes the throne and his plan comes to public knowledge, who knows what's going to happen? So he makes sure to protect the king here. So verse 8, So all the Levites and all Judah did according to all that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And each one of them took his men who were to come in on the Sabbath with those who were to go out on the Sabbath. For Jehoiada the priest did not dismiss any of the divisions. So again, you have this Shifting of responsibilities between the Levites. There's a lot of people gathering here around the temple, which is somewhat concealing this overall plan. Verse 9, Then Jehoiada the priest gave to the captains of the hundreds the spears and the large and small shields, which had been King David's, which were in the house of God. So he does indeed arm the people in case things go the wrong way. Verse 10, he stationed all the people, each man with his weapon in his hand, from the right side of the house to the left side of the house, by the altar and by the house, around the king. So everything has, the plan has been developed. It has been put in place. Now the last step is for the execution of the plan. And that's what we see in verse 11. Then they brought out the king's son and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony and made him king. And Jehoiada and his sons anointed him and said, Long live the king. So now with verse 11, we see the reinstitution of the Davidic king upon the throne of Judah. That being the seven-year-old Joash. 
And notice here they put they put the crown on him, and then it says they gave him the testimony. Now people debate what the testimony is. Some people believe it's some kind of royal insignia, some kind of possible jewelry, something to signify that this is indeed the king. Other people believe that it could be the Davidic covenant in written form. And then other people, including myself, believe that this is probably the law of Moses. Because remember what the responsibility was for a king in Israel. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20 tells us, Now it shall come about when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on the scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall be with him, and he shall read it on the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by carefully observing all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his countrymen, and that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. So that was the responsibility of the king as outlined in Deuteronomy. So when it says that they gave him the testimony, I assume that this is the law of Moses. Now, I don't want to be dogmatic on that. It could be a written copy of the Davidic covenant, or it could be some type of royal insignia. But the point is, is they gave him the things which a king was to have, or were to have. And they took it a step further. Jehoiada and sons anointed him to be the king. So they're publicly testifying that this is the king. And then they say, long live the king. So Joash now is on the throne of the southern kingdom. But what about Ataliah? What, what is going on with her? Well, she finds out about this. I mean, there's no way to conceal it. They did a good job of concealing the plan to bring Joash to the point of being anointed and being called king. But what about Ataliah? Well, verse 12 says, When Ataliah heard the noise of the people running and praising the king. So now, again, everything is made made public. There's commotion throughout the temple grounds throughout Jerusalem here. People running and praising the king. So this is a joyful occasion for the people. So she hears this, and the rest of verse 12 says, she came into the house of the Lord to the people. So she runs in. Verse 13, she looked. So again, picture this. She's running. She's hearing all this commotion, all this praising of the king. Again, she's executed all these children who had a right to the throne of David. She runs in, she looks, and this text says, and behold. I think that behold there is to kind of capture our, to capture our attention. The king was standing by his pillar at the entrance. Now most scholars believe that this is one of the two pillars at the entrance of the temple. It's possible, again, don't want to be dogmatic here, but it's possible that the king is standing right here, the seven-year-old king, the son of Ahaziah. And the captains and the trumpeters were beside the king. And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets. The singers were with their musical instruments, leading the praise. So this is a joyful time of celebrating the new Davidic king. And Ataliah comes in. And she sees all this going on. So what does she do? Look at the rest of verse 13. Then Ataliah tore her clothes and said, Treason! Treason! Now there's some irony here. She's the one who's the traitor. She's the one who slew the children of Ahaziah, all of them except Joash. And Joash is hidden by the providential hand of God through Jehoiada and his wife. She's the traitor. She's the one that illegally took the throne. And here she is. Treason! Treason! She's looking at the Davidic king. Again, God has put His plans in place, the Davidic covenant, that a son of David were, was to be sitting on that throne. And she rebels against that 
and takes a throne for herself. And she's the one who says treason, treason. Quite a bit of irony there. So what happens? you got this, this climatic event. Verse 14, Jehoiada the priest brought out the captains of the hundreds who were appointed over the army and said to them, Bring her out between the ranks, and whoever follows her put to death with the sword. So in other words, bring her out and any of her followers because they deserve the death penalty. But they're going to do this outside the temple. Because once again, Jehoiada, even though he's putting this plan in place, the right plan to restore Joash, he's still being very careful not to, tr to himself transgress or cause transgression against the Lord's commandments and the Mosaic law. And that's why the rest of verse 14 says, For the priest said, Let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. Because this is not a house of blood, not of human blood. Remember, David wasn't allowed to build a temple because he was a man of bloodshed. That's why Solomon built it. So he recognizes that for her and her followers to be executed, it must be outside the temple grounds. So verse 15, So they seized her. And when she arrived at the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, so now it's shifted from the temple proper down to the king's house, the text says they put her to death there. So she is rightfully executed. So again, verse 15, So they seized her, and when she arrived at the entrance of the horse gate of the king's house, they put her to death there. And that's the last of Ataliah. Now, what's missing? When a king dies, what, do we, what have we been reading? A summary statement, don't we? Such and such reigned for so many years. They were so old when they were put on the throne, etc., etc., etc. That's not included here, is it? We don't read that of Ataliah. And I think it's purposeful. My opinion is, I don't want to be dogmatic, but I believe it's purposeful that that's not in there because she was never seen to be a rightful king or queen, a rightful ruler over Israel. She was not in the line of David. So with that, her reign, her unofficial reign, ends. And now we shift gears. After Joash is put on the throne, Ataliah is executed, there needs to be a little cleanup a little spiritual cleanup in Jerusalem. And that's what we see. Verse 16, The Jehoiada made a covenant between himself and all the people and the king that they would be the Lord's people. So we see here in verse 16 a very first step put in place. Oops. A very first step. They made a covenant. So this, this, we see a lot of covenants being made in this chapter. So Jehoiada makes a covenant between himself and all the people and the king. So they all get together here, and they form a covenant, they form an agreement. And specifically, what is that covenant to do? To specify that they would be the Lord's people. Now, they are the Lord's people, they're, they're Jews. So what this means here is that they, not that they are the Lord's people in a sense that hey, we just recognize, hey, we're Jewish. I think this specifies that they would serve the Lord because the people of the Lord should serve the Lord the way He intends them. In other words, I think they're pledging here to walk in the ways of God. And that's important. They just got rid of this very wicked ruler. I remember, Ataliah was part of the house of Ahab. She was very influenced by the idolatrous ways of the house of Ahab. So she's removed, so now there needs to be some spiritual reform. So the first step is to acknowledge it as a, as a people. So verse 17, all the people went into the house of Baal. I love this verse right here. I just, you know, again, picture what's going on here. All the people went into the house of Baal and tore it down, and they broke it in pieces, his altars and his images. So obviously, Queen Ataliah here was promoting Baal religion, which again, that would have went with the house of Ahab. 
and she was leading the people away from Yahweh to this false god. So Jehoiada leads the people after making this covenant. They go to the Baal temple, they tear it down, and they take the altars, and they take all these images and completely destroy them. I just, I just love that scene there. We're getting rid. We are going to rid ourselves of this false religion. And they even go to the point of killing one of the major priests. Verse 17, the rest of it says, and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. So they even kill a major priest of the Baal worship. Now that may bother some people, How? You know, it's, but Deuteronomy 13, you can write down and go look up later, Deuteronomy 13, specifically verses 6 through 11, Part of the Mosaic Law requires idolaters to be stoned and killed. Any people who are leading the people astray, are leading them away from Yahweh, they were to be executed under Mosaic Law. So this would be a righteous act by Jehoiada and the people. Verse 18, so now they've cleared out all the negative, now they have to rebuild it. Not literally the Baal Temple, but rebuild the spiritual climate of righteousness. So verse 18 says, Moreover, Jehoiada placed the offices of the house of the Lord under the authority of the Levitical priests, whom David had assigned over the house of the Lord, to offer the burnt offerings of the Lord, as it's written in the law of Moses, with rejoicing and singing according to the order of David. So they've gotten rid of this false pagan worship system, and now Jehoiada rightly restores the authority under the Levitical priesthood. Everything is being done, once again, according to the law of Moses. Verse 19, He stationed the gatekeepers to the house of the Lord, so that no one would enter who was in any way unclean. Further restoration back to the law. Verse 20, He took the captains of the hundreds, the nobles, the rulers of the people, and all the people of the land, and brought the king down from the house of the Lord, and came through the upper gate to the king's house. So now we focus back on Joash. Last time we saw him, he was standing at the pillars of the temple. Now he's brought down to the king's house. And that would be an important place at this point in time because that's where the throne is. And the rest of verse 20 says, And they placed the king upon the royal throne. So Joash has been anointed. He's been given the kingly Items, and now he is officially placed on the throne. So we now, we now have, once again, a Davidic ruler on the throne. And again, remember, the readers are post-exile Jews coming back from Babylon, looking at a temple, or parts of a temple, not having a Davidic ruler. So this is encouraging them and giving them hope. Now we know historically another Davidic ruler did not ascend to the throne, even in the time of, of post-exile Israel. And we still look for a day where the rightful heir of David takes the throne. But we know there's only one, and that is Jesus Christ. And we saw that he came to Jerusalem in his earthly ministry. He presented himself as the Messiah, as the rightful king to rule over the kingdom, and the Jewish leadership rejected it. So that plan has been put in, in placed on hold right now as we've moved into the church age. But there will come a time where Jesus Christ will return and He will, according to the Davidic covenant, take His rightful place on the literal throne of David in Jerusalem. And once again, Israel will have their king. And we'll get to come alongside But the rest of verse, or chapter 23, verse 21 says, So all the people of the land rejoiced. So there is great rejoicing at this spiritual triumph. And the city was quiet, meaning that it was in a time of peace. They were back to fulfilling the will of God. For they had put Ataliah to death with the sword. So what do we walk away with? Well, one point I think is important to see in all of this. You know, we have Ahaziah killed by Jehu, and then all his children are killed by Ataliah. 
So we have no Davidic throne, but through the providence of God, one child, Joash, is hidden. Jehoiada puts the plan in place to restore him to his rightful throne. So it's very chaotic. It's very movie-like what we're seeing here. But I think one of the major focuses, foci, that we can walk away with is that the Lord will fulfill His plans despite the best efforts of men. Ataliah was not a threat to the plan of God. She wasn't more sovereign than he was, or he is. He allowed it to happen at that point. He allowed her to reign her six years. And then he allowed Jehoiada to carry out this plan to bring the Davidic ruler back to the throne. So the Lord will fulfill His plans despite the best efforts of men. So things may look chaotic. Things may look like they're going all over the place and we don't know what's going to happen. It's all under control. And it's all under His control. And that's where when the, the world gets chaotic, when things just start going crazy, we just have to realize that He's in control. And He is good. And He is righteous. And it's all going to end in a way He sees fit. And He's given many of the details already. And that's where our hope and trust is. And that's why as believers, when we're walking around, we're seeing everyone you know, running around like Chicken Little. You know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and we're sitting there just with peace and calm. People are going to look at us and be like, what's wrong with you? It's like, yeah, it's chaotic. It may not be fun. I may not like this, but you know what? He has it under control. It's all good. Father, we thank you for another day. We thank you for your word and what it teaches us. So help us to be men and women who put our trust in you and you alone. And despite what's going on in the world, we can just lean upon your word and your promises because we know you are good and you are righteous. So we thank you for who you are. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.